Welcome, everybody. I've got Scott Church, and we're here to talk about spring cleaning. It is the springtime. You might be cleaning out your closet, your garage, your storage unit, and you might find that old shoebox of cards that you used to have. So we all know about Star Wars, Star Trek, Lord of the Rings, the big IPs that, oh, if you have this, this might be valuable. But what about some of the lesser known stuff you might find, whether it's cleaning out the closet or you bought a collection of magic cards and it has this other stuff in it and you think, what is this? So we have 10 games to look out for when you're picking up a collection. Scott, it's great to have you here again, man. Um, I was joking with you before. It looks like you're like sitting behind a Kinko's right now. <laughs> All the envelopes. Yeah, this is a packing area of our office. I got an employee workstation behind me and then uh, kind of the area I pull uh, packing supplies from. So yeah, this is this is more of our packing area in the office. I feel like I even dated myself saying Kinko's, right? Because it's not even, doesn't even exist anymore. That's uh, right. So if folks don't know, Category 1 Games sells and stocks and, and buys a lot of these games. So check out Scott's store, you know, link here in the, the bio. But uh, let's actually get to the, the topic at hand here. So w- these are the 10 games to look out for when you pick up a collection. We're going to talk a little about the games and then also how to find a set and maybe some you know promos. There's always a weird rule with everything. It's like, oh, the, the last set or the promos or whatever it is. So these are just a couple of things to look out for. So, uh, Scott, I'm going to hand the baton to you and, and stop talking here. Cool, Matt. And hey, everybody, thanks for watching. We really appreciate it. This is really fun to do. And uh, the support you have for Matt's channel is, is great, as well as for us. So many people contact me and say, hey, I found you uh, on Matt's channel uh, as well as my own channel. So that's really fun. And it's always fun to talk about these these various CCGs. So, you know, a lot of people say, hey, I got this storage unit or I bought this magic collection. I got this other game included. What is this? So a lot of us know Overpower. Overpower is one of the most common games of the mid 90s. A ton of the very first set was released. And so you can always find this stuff. But the problem is, is finding those later cards and like the last few sets where the real money's at. So if you find, you know, your shoebox of cards and you say, hey, I got all these overpower cards. And if they have that border that's like a yellowish orange border, probably not a lot of value there from the very first set. But if you have cards from the later expansions or some of the promos, you see this Batman foil. There's about six foil cards that are all $100 plus. And the cards here in this picture are all very pricey cards because they're from the later expansions. They're harder to find. They're one per decks. They're good cards. They're very playable. And so if you are going through your stuff and you find these type of cards, especially with the border here of the any character or X-Man, that's going to be where the money cards are at for this game. So look for that. There's only probably like 2% of the overall overpower card base that's actually valuable. And this is definitely part of it. Yeah, that can be such a hard thing when you get like the shoe box and you're like, I have 5,000 cards. How do I find that 2%? Yeah. And I mean, in those cases, it's a time versus money. All this stuff is always time versus money. The more time you're going to spend, the more you're going to actualize the value of your collection. And if you don't want to spend three hours and like, that's okay as well. Like you can always just 50 bucks collection on eBay, you know, and it, it will sell. So it, just uh, something to think about that when you think about selling cards, it can be very tedious. Right. Yeah. And if you want to maximize it, you've got to put the time into it. And so that's yeah. that's something that a lot of people don't understand that concept. I want the most for this, but I'm not going to do anything. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. This this page basically is a shout out for Andy because Andy is looking for some of these cards right now and is paying a, a decent amount for them. And if, if you're a friend of the channel and watch Matt's other videos, you know, Andy's on here a lot. Uh, Guardians is one of those games that they produced a lot of the very first uh, set and the reprint set. They will have at the bottom of each card in the middle, there's a little icon and it'll be a blue or white icon if it's the first set or the reprint of the first set. It's like the limited and unlimited. Now, the other sets have little icons here, like an infinity sign. Some of them have like a little arrow looking sign and that will be for the, the different sets. And that's how you tell if they're from one of these other sets and not the limited or unlimited. And those two are are the least impressive and and value-wise. But you get some from these other sets, and there's some value in here. These are, I think, each about $60 plus. Um, So looking for Guardians definitely is something where if you have have this in your bag of games, uh, look to see if they have the dots. And if they have the dots, you know they're probably not as valuable. But if they have some of these other symbols on the bottom, 
you've got some value here. And and obviously you see the names of these ones. They're definitely making fun of other gains. The, the stronghold downgrade, that's because Magic was releasing stronghold around that same time. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's they basically made fun of all the other card games out there. Um, this is a fun one. Imagination, man. This is I didn't realize the fan base for this was so rabid and, and kind of the intricacies of this of this game. And it is very popular. People love this game. And in fact, there's a Kickstarter going on right now for it. If you're if you're into it and want to play again, the Kickstarter I don't think comes out until the end of something like 2025. So it's a ways off, but you can get in on it and and pick up what you want. Uh, this sets this game's really interesting. There's uh, a limited and unlimited, and to tell the difference between limited and unlimited, unlimited will not have a little eye right here uh, where the cards at, and you can see the eye here on these other cards because they're all going to be the first printing um of their respective sets so there's a premiere and a unlimited and they both have it either an i for uh, limited or a no i for unlimited the other set icons are in the bottom right of the cards and this game there's foils for just about every card uh in the game and so the foils about three times five times as much as the regular version so finding foils finding promos for the game uh, there's a lot of interest. There's a lot of people that want this game, but there's just not a lot of people selling it online. Very few sellers on eBay. Uh, we we listed about uh, 10, 10 rows of cards, and we're down to about six. I mean, we sold four rows of cards within three weeks. Just the demand for it was off the charts. People loved it, knowing they could source it from one place very easily. So if you have this in your collection, take a look because you've got some value here. Is a row of cards approximately, is that like a, a, a industry term for about a thousand? <laughs> like, that, that's right. Yeah. So like, you know, I, we usually have about four, we use four row boxes and two row boxes and for sports cards is an 800 count per row. And uh, for game cards is about a thousand. So, yeah. Wow. So we, I mean, we sold, we had one guy that he probably picked over 1200 cards up once we listed it. I mean, it's crazy. Um, there's just a lot of love for it. And he was buying for his, his friends and family that all used to play, and he's glad to play it again. Um, all right, Aliens vs. Predator. Now, this game, there's two sets, and there's a lot of promos. If you have the uh, the card in the bottom left here, I mean, this is like a $400 card. At least it was at, at one point. Uh, there's promos for, uh, like, this chest burster. You can see the spacing on the lettering is a little further out. That's how you can tell if you have promos for the game or not. And the promos, uh, at least there's about eight of them or so, eight to 12, that have the spacing that's off. And that's a guaranteed promo for it. If you compare it against, uh, like, Under Its Gaze, which is also from the first set. The second set had a different border. That's what this uh, card here is. It's from the second set. And you can tell the border's different, and it looks a little cleaner. Uh, the images from the from the game just aren't, aren't the best images because it wasn't, for whatever reason just wasn't the best graphic design but yeah this is this is a game where if you have some of these promos like chest burster a lot of these were given out in like inquests and scries you know they, they hold some value so look for those in your collection uh same thing with this uh conestoga class i guess is how you say it uh yeah i mean this is a very valuable searched after card so if you have those you've got some money there is this even a fun the, game to play? I, I just I've seen it like it, or is just people collect it, or is it fun to play? It's mostly collectors. I don't know if the playing is necessarily that fun. I think people enjoy it that are into it, but I think for the random player that has played other card games, getting into it would be like, what? This is kind of, you know, just not the best game they've ever played. So, yeah. interesting. Uh, Anna Mayhem. Uh, this is kind of a fun game. Uh, there was the first two sets released were based around different animes and really the rules and gameplay was fairly terrible. So they redesigned the gameplay of it for the, the third set, which was a Dragon Ball Z set. And they finally went where their money was at. Dragon Ball Z is always going to sell. So the, the third set for the game actually sold pretty well. And these are the ultra rare promos from it. And if you have one of these ultra rare promos, uh, these are valuable cards. And even the rares from this third set hold some value. If you have cards from this game and they don't look like Dragon Ball Z, they probably have less value than you thought. 
The other thing to look for for this game are the promos. Man, the promos for this can go up very high in price, and there's some serious collectors out there for them. So if you have promos from this game, you know, look for what you can get for those cards because you can command a decent amount. Scott, this is why I love talking to you. I had no idea this game <laughs> ever existed. Like, this is educational for me because I just have never heard of this. And, I mean, it's interesting because I think now you have – a couple of these modern anime like vice farts or whatever i think does a similar thing except perhaps more like anime girls let's say but it's a right. similar concept and there's always an appetite for anime based card games i think right yeah it's it's insanely popular and this was basically the first anime card game to come out and it's a shame the gameplay wasn't that good otherwise i think this could have really had a longer life to it um but it was kind of i think it was rushed out and just didn't use the best properties that would have lasting impact. And then this Dragon Ball Z set was popular. Scores saw that and released their game in 2000, 2003. So anyways, mm -hmm. and we've had nonstop reboots of Dragon Ball Z games ever since. <laughs> so, all right, Doom Trooper. This is a fun one. This is one of those early 90s games that, I mean, the art from it looks cool. It's because they took a... Uh, circular thing looked at images from different magazines that they had related to the game found cool shots took a picture of it and then that got used for the for the game itself and so that's why they're all circular uh, this game's there's some sets that I've still never even seen physically much bigger in in the UK than it is here in the US but there's still people that collect it here in the US to tell the sets apart, they had this little icon in the bottom or kind of middle right of the card underneath the image. And that will tell you if it's from a what set it's from. There's different icons for different sets. The Premier set has a red border around it. And the Unlimited of the Premier set does not have that red border. That's how to tell those apart. And there's a lot of value here just about in every set from this game. Some of the rares command 10 plus uh and you can have multiple quantity of them and so the value is really there for it this golgotha the warrior princess card this was a card given out i want to say an inquest in fact it has the inquest logo there for it for being a promo this is a 70 dollar card so if you can find the sealed inquest of this if it's less than 70 dollars to buy that it's worth buying just for the card itself so this is a really interesting game where there's a lot more players like i said in collectors than the uk and over in Europe than there are in the U.S., but there are collectors here that are willing to pay a decent amount for it. Matt, do you have any experience with this game at all? I've never seen – I'm getting this confused with Doom Town, and oh, sure. I was trying to think about what this IP was. Um, I, I just don't know, you know, was it like a comic book from the 90s? Ro Role-playing game. So it was a big role-playing game franchise, okay. and, and so that's what they basically pulled all these images from. Okay. Yeah, I just, this is one where I'm like, I, I don't know anything about this. I, Doomtown is really cool. That's a great game. Right, right. Yeah, and I don't know how the gameplay goes with it, but I just know that when we get stuff in for it, I mean, like I said, there's like two sets I still haven't even seen, but when we add in new stuff for it, it sells really quickly. All right, here's a fun one, Netrunner. Uh, there's three main sets, and the way you tell the sets apart is in the bottom of every card, it'll say V1.0, V2.0, or V2.1. And that's that's the way you can tell the sets from each other. And there's actually five cards that are promo cards. It's, it's basically a five-card set, and it's these top four cards here and the bottom right card, I believe. And if you find those, those cards are very valuable. Uh, they didn't have a general release. You couldn't buy them in packs, anything along those lines. This game was really popular and fun to play right off the bat. People loved it. It was produced by Wizards of the Coast. So they were looking to put out other games besides Magic for a while. And then they basically pulled back and were only doing Magic. So games like this that were popular and had a fan base basically lost their the maker of it. And so they, it just lost its steam because Wizards of the Coast was not supporting it. But the fans loved it. I mean, it eventually came back as a living card game which was also very successful for many years. So there's a dedicated fan base for it. Uh, there's cards that are definitely valuable from it, especially from V2.0 and 2.1. The first set's easier to find, obviously, but those other sets, man, there's some value there.
This is a really solid game. I think that this is also one that is not a magic clone. So I have played this and I played the living card game as well. And I would recommend those experience. I mean, the living card game is way more accessible from a price standpoint, but this game rocks. And I think it breaks the mold of being a magic clone where you have power versus defense sort of battles. This is asynchronous gameplay. One person's a hacker, the other's a corporation. I, I just think it's a really fun game uh, that you can have a different kind of card experience with. And I would recommend the living card game for accessibility reasons, but you can probably pick that up pretty easily. But this, the original one is insanely hard to find. <laughs> it is. And there's a lot of value here. Um, and so we'll, we'll, I'll try to speed this up here. I, I'm, I'm enjoying going over this. I'll take a little bit longer. I'll, all right. The mythos card game, a uh, really cool card game. The sets all have these different borders to them. And so the last set has more of this looks like still, Still flooring type of border to it. This last set has a lot of value. This is new Aeon. And this is where a lot of value is for the game. The earlier sets, not much value to it, but new Aeon, highly collectible, highly desired by the fan base. Uh, if you're a Lovecraft fan, this is kind of one of those must have just for the amazing artwork in it. Even if the gameplay isn't great, uh, it's really a fun game to kind of even just look through and see the cards. I love like this guy looking at something pouring out at him. You know, it's just just goofy and fun uh, kind of look through it. Yeah, my understanding is this game, they, they sort of went through different mythologies with each booster. They started off with kind of the Greek pantheon, and then they went into like New England, uh, Lovecraftian stuff. And so I think it's a really fun premise. Uh, I've actually never really seen the cards. Before. The cards don't jump out at me as I want to own these, you know, but <laughs> it right. goes a lot of 90s uh, templates, right, used for, for cards. Right. And and there's people that just love Lovecraft, you know, the mythology behind it and everything along those lines. So this is this is one of those games where I think a lot of people didn't know about it or have overlooked it. So this last set and the game itself is highly collectible for that very reason. Um, all right. This is G.I. Joe. <laughs> we all love G.I. Joe, right? I mean, who doesn't love early 2000s G.I. Joe artwork and the different characters from the 80s? And there's only two sets for this game. It's fairly small. Uh, it does, it plays like war. It's not very fun to play, but G.I. Joe collectors love it. And the cards from it are worth a lot. It was not produced heavily. There's a lot of starter decks out there, but the it kind of did what the X-Men trading card game did, where the starters were released before the packs were, and the packs were just harder to find. And the game basically died before they really came out. So the, the cards from it are fairly valuable most of the rares are between 10 and 40 dollars uh, especially the foils and so it it makes it kind of an interesting game to find so if you find this in a collection kind of one of those where you're going to be pretty happy about it because this is going to have some value for you huh I, I know there's like that logan paul blow up about like he got gi <laughs> joe cards instead of pokemon or something and, and that was like gi joe card games moment over the last five years right like being being uh, mentioned by logan paul yeah, this could be the second time it's been mentioned on YouTube in the past five years. You know, yeah. like <laughs> no one really talks about it. All right, our last game, Conan. What I mean, what an awesome game. Uh, people love to collect it if you're a Conan fan, and there's a lot of them out there, surprisingly. Uh, and this game just has so much value to it because it's so hard to find. I had a booster box in stock. It sold recently for $2,000. Oof. It's it's not cheap. And so that guy, he was looking to finish off cards for a set. So he's like, hey, I might be able to get you some cards that you need. And I know he was still missing one card. And he's like, if you find this card, he's like, I know what you have it for on your site, but I'll give you $160 for it. I just want to get it done. And that's how the collectors feel for it. There's promos. There's foils. There's just amazing looking cards. You know, I don't think anyone really actually played it. But from a collector's standpoint, it's definitely one to pick up. Yeah, this is a game I have a, a decent amount of experience with. I started collecting it, uh, and the, the game creator, Jason Robinette's actually a, a, been a guest on the show before. Uh, if you want to learn more about Conan, we did a whole video on Conan and developing it. Uh, I'd recommend checking that out. But really cool game. The problem with the first set is there's 10 ultra rares, <laughs> which from a collecting standpoint feels abusive because it was one ultra rare per booster box. Hmm. So it's just like, that's rough, man. That is nearly impossible to get the ultra rares. And the game was really short printed. I think we went over kind of what happened. I think there was just a, a kind of a failure to launch there for the game, uh, but short printed. 
but uh, I actually have two decks built that I don't know how to use. <laughs> but uh, Jason built me two decks, and uh, someday I'm going to do a how to play. But I actually don't know how to play myself. So, <laughs> yeah, that's great, Matt. Yeah, I mean, this is this is kind of the list. Of, if you have these games, you know, in your binders or you know, in in a collection you buy, you should be pretty happy about it. You know, especially some of these later ones where conan it's like you have any cards from it it's going to hold some value whereas some of these other ones like overpower look for those last few sets so yeah it's it's pretty fun to go through a list like this and see some of the fun games that are on here that you might not see all that often online yeah and that also don't necessarily have you know major ip supporting them i know that you know overpower had marvel but it, it's not the same perhaps as like st movie stills with star trek or star wars <laughs> or you know the decipher games that i think people just you know, love Vigo Mortensen. They want a picture of Aragorn that's shiny. And that's, you know, there's more appeal, I think, long lasting. So it's interesting to see these other games. Uh, I think we did a count once that there was over 200 card games that launched from 94 to like 2005. You know, and obviously of that 200, you had less than a dozen that made it to 2020, we'll say. And some, you know, like Legends of Five Rings died then. So it's just, it's it's hard. It's really hard to make a workable right. product long term. And, uh, but that doesn't mean that these games aren't worth, you know, kind of reminiscing and, and going back on and thinking about a little bit. So, uh, Scott, any kind of closing thoughts here? No, just keep playing the games you love. I mean, that's, uh, we're kind of talking from a collector's standpoint, but I'm always for people actually playing and enjoying these games and enjoying their hobby, whether it's a collecting side or the playing side. I'll say this as someone who has lots of niche hobbies, both playing and pl playing and collecting, it is nice to have something that feels like my own, right? Like you, you can go anywhere, magic, Pokemon, but it's like, this is, this is my thing. And I like having my thing that isn't shared by millions of people. And uh, the communities in these also tend to be pretty close knit and pretty friendly. And, and uh, I, I've just really been surprised at how much joy I've gotten out of collecting and playing these games and, and also doing this content. So this is just a moment to say thanks for, for tuning in, everybody. Hopefully this was a helpful video. I wish you luck with your spring cleaning. Uh, may your closets be cleaner than mine is, which is overflowing with games that I don't have the time for. So uh, that's all we have for today, guys. Have a great rest of your week, and we'll talk to you later.